of last year. We gave you a sense of what we were going to try to accomplish this year, and you were encouraged to know that Dr. Peter Craig is going to be our speaker. Next year, uh, we have an incredible opportunity. Uh, we will combine the Anglican Way Institute with what is going to be called, is being called, the International Catholic Congress of Anglicans, meeting at Fort Worth. This is a congress, a conference, to give a context for Catholic-minded Anglicans to talk about the doctrine of the church. So the subtitle is um, International Catholic Congress of Anglicans um, for a Conciliar Church and Her Mission. So we hope that you will come to this congress. We'll have uh, an Anglican Way Institute component within this Congress uh, so that you can have a lot of the same dynamics. Uh, Forward in Faith, North America is going to be combining their annual assembly also with this international Congress. There will be Anglican leaders from all over the world, archbishops, bishops, clergy, laity, uh, England, Global South, and this will be a very significant Congress. The last time Anglicanism had Congresses like this was in the 1920s, and they were quite significant. You will want to be a part of this. We want the Anglican Way Institute to be very much at the center of it. Uh, bishop Michael Nazar Allen, you may know, former Bishop of Rochester, and Bishop Keith Ackerman are the co-chairs of it. They asked me to be a, a theologian in residence, one of the speakers, along with Bishop Michael Nazarali, Bishop Ackerman, and others. This will really be a choice opportunity. And yet, we'll try to provide some of the special aspects of Anglican Way Institute within. Musically, in terms of breakout workshops, specially designed for Anglican Way. But you will also have the opportunity to uh, interact with uh, uh, Anglicans uh, and Anglican leaders from all over the world. The dates for this Congress will be July 16 through 19. July 16 through 19. And it will be at St. Andrew's Anglican Church in downtown Fort Worth. We have uh, on the table back there for Parish Press, we have information, I believe, about the hotels. Uh, Forward and Faith Table. Forward and Faith Table, sorry. Forward and Faith Table right, right next to Parish Press. Get the information about the hotel. We've already blocked out uh, uh, basically an entire hotel. This is going to be a rather large Congress and conference. The following year, in 2016, we'll come back here. I've already asked Dr. Peter Craig if he'd be willing to come back. And he said he is willing. that we have wanted to address among many out there is the area of, of, of Christian apologetics and how to defend the faith in this postmodern world. And of course, Dr. Peter Craig is, is a, a, a leading theologian, um, Christian philosopher, author on, on this topic. So I, we, we, we have a, a, a great um, intrigue in store. And this will be a very important topic uh, that I think you'll want to invite your friends to. You have a sense of, of what this Congress is, what this conference is, and uh, we, I think, feel good about how this conference has gone. I hope you do, uh, in terms of uh, all of the pieces to it, as Father Casey did. So, Mark, uh, next summer, those dates in July. You'll be hearing about it. We'll be sending you information and get the word out and bring your friends to Fort Worth next summer. It's an opportunity actually for us to take what we're doing at Anglican Way Institute out to a much larger audience and help us do that because I think it'll be like bread on the water coming back in the following years. Okay, Father Casey, anything else? Alright, so again.
again, it's a great privilege and opportunity to have Dr. Craig with us. And now we uh, invite him to come for his final uh, lecture to us.
Christendom is by far the most dramatic thing that has ever been seen in the world. It's the ongoing presence of Christ himself. And whether it's true or false, uh, Christianity is fundamentally this drama, this story. If somebody says, I can't believe it, it's just too good to be true, it's too wild to be true, it's too crazy to be true, I say, good for you. Uh, you. You've read it, you understood it. But if somebody says, oh, of course I believe it, and all religions are the same, and it's, it's very nice, I say, you've never read it. Or if somebody says, I can't believe it because it's too boring, I have almost no respect for such a person. <laughs> she begins by saying, we are constantly assured that the churches are empty today, uh, she was writing this in the 50s, because preachers insist too much upon dogma. Dull dogma, as people call it. So the fact is the precise opposite. It is the neglect of dogma that makes for dullness. The Christian faith is the most exciting drama that ever staggered the imagination of man. And the dogma is the drama. That drama is summarized quite clearly in the creeds of the church. And if we think it dull, it is because we have either never really read those amazing documents or have recited them so often and mechanically to have lost all sense of their meaning. The plot pivots upon a single character, and the whole action is the answer to a single central question, what think ye of Christ? Before we adopt any of the unofficial solutions, some of which are indeed excessively dull, before we dismiss Christ as a myth, or an idealist, or a demagogue, or a liar, or a lunatic, it might do no harm to find out what the creeds really say about him. What does the church think of Christ? The church's answer is categorical and uncompromising. It is that Jesus bar Joseph, the carpenter of Nazareth, was in fact and in truth and in the most exact and literal sense of the word, the God by whom all things were made. I recall the very first page of Pope John Paul II's book on Jesus, where he uh, refers to uh, a dialogue with his uh, very good uh, Jewish friend, Rabbi Klausner. Uh, and the rabbi asks, uh, yes, of course, Jesus was an admirable person and probably a great prophet and a great philosopher, but, but what did he leave? What did he give us? How did he change history? After he left, people died, people suffered, people sinned, people wore, uh, didn't seem to give us anything we didn't have before. And the Pope said, well, the answer is very simple. He gave us God. Oh, how could we not see that? His personality, she says, was the personality of God, insofar as that personality could be expressed in human terms. The man we hanged was God Almighty. And this is the dogma we find dull, the terrifying drama of which God is the victim as well as the hero. Chesterton says somewhere, Christianity is the only religion in the world that has added courage to the virtues of the divine nature, or the divine person. If this is dull, then what in heaven's name is worthy to be called exciting? The people who hanged Christ never, to do them justice, accused him of being a bore. On the contrary, they thought him much too dynamic to be safe. It's fascinating that if you read the Gospels, you'll find a word occurring over and over again. There are not too many psychological words in the Gospels. That is, the, the psychological reaction of uh, Jesus, of the apostles, of his enemies, of, of all characters, uh, is not front and center. It's not a typically modern document in that way. It's a typically ancient document. He said this, he did this, this happened. Uh, you, of course, do feel how the people felt in his presence, but the, the, the authors don't tell you how to feel. In other words, they're good writers. Uh, but there is one word that describes the psychological state of mind that's used perhaps more often than any other. And it's used of both his enemies and his friends, 
and those who can't decide whether they should be his enemies or his friends, but who, since they were reasonable and sane people, unlike some modern theologians, realized that they had to choose between one or the other. The word is thelma, or thelmaze, which is usually translated wonder, or amazement, or astonishment. Discombobulation. Jesus was literally the only person in the history of the world who never once bored anybody. Except maybe King Herod, which tells us more about Herod than about Christ. On the contrary, they thought him too dynamic to be safe. It has been left for later generations to muffle that shattering personality, to surround him with an atmosphere of tedium. We have very efficiently paired the claws of the Lion of Judah, certified him meek and mild, and recommended him as a fitting household pet for pale curates and pious old ladies. What an insult to both curates and pious old ladies. <laughs> If he really was both God and man, then when the man, Jesus, died, God died. And when God rose from the dead, man rose too, because they were one. Now, if we're going to disbelieve a thing, it seems on the whole to be desirable that we should first find out what exactly we are disbelieving. How, how sane? But sanity is taken for granted far too often. One of my favorite books of theology is Frank Sheed's Society of Theology and Sanity. Brilliant, clear, uh, perhaps the best description of the doctrine of the Trinity for beginners that I've ever read. And his other book, Society of Sanity, is equally sane. I'm going to say something about that in connection with Sayers in a few moments. We may call this divine revelation, or we may call it rubbish. But if we call it dull, our words have no meaning at all. That God should play the tyrant over man is a dismal story of unrelieved oppression. But that man should play the tyrant over, and that man should play the tyrant over man is the usual dreary record of human futility. But that man should play the tyrant over God is an astonishing drama indeed. Any journalist hearing of this for the first time would recognize it as news. Those who did hear it for the first time actually called it news, the good news. But we are apt to forget that the word gospel ever meant anything so sensational. <clears throat> One's basic fundamental attitude towards everything, uh, towards a thing, colors every other reaction that we have. Uh, intellectual, moral, emotional. There's a, a category in the Bible, and in St. Augustine, the heart, which has a kind of mystical meaning. Sometimes it simply means the seat of emotions. And some emotions are specifically human, some we share with the animals. And sometimes it's a synonym for the word will. But at other times, it's more mystical than that. It's, it's a word that designates the absolute center of a person from which everything else flows, including the intellect and the will and the emotions, all of which are objectifiable and specifiable and definable functions, which are distinct from each other, like branches on a tree. But the heart is the very trunk of the tree. And these fundamental attitudes come from the heart. And if our fundamental attitude towards Christianity is boredom, then no matter how brilliant you are and how, how moral you are and how interesting your emotions are, you will fundamentally misunderstand it. I didn't understand all that at the first time I read Dorothy Sayers consciously, but I did unconsciously. So I said, she's on to something. The second big idea which she shares with the other Inklings very well, especially with C.S. Lewis, uh, is her negative apologetics, her critique of modernity, especially as modernity has seeped into Christendom in, in the form of a kind of liberal or modernist or nationalist theology. Here is her brilliant critique of the uh, optimistic futurism of typical liberal theology. 
Such men, she says, finding no value for the world as it is, proclaim loudly their faith in the future. They say, it is in the hands of the young. With this flattery, they bind their own burden on the shoulders of the next generation. For their own failures, time alone is to blame, not sin, which is expiable, but time, which is irreparable. From the relentless reality of age, they seek escape into a fantasy of youth, their own or other people's. First love, boyhood ideals, childish dreams, the soul at the mother's breast, the blind security of the womb. From these, they construct a monstrous fabric of pretense to be their hiding place from the tempest. Their faith is not really in the future, but in the past. Paradoxical as it may seem, to believe in youth is to look backward. To look forward, we must believe in age. Paradox truly worthy of Chesterton. Christ said, except ye become as little children. And the words are sometimes quoted to justify the flight into infantilism. <laughs> now, children differ in many ways, but they have one thing in common. All normal children look forward to growing up. Okay, that's a, that's a genuine oops. One of the great differences between Orthodox Christian theology and liberal modernist revisionist Christian theology is this question of boredom. The first may indeed be a, a horrible, oppressive, mythological uh, construct, but it's not boring. And the second may indeed be a reasonable and scientific, enlightened and progressive idea, but it's crashing bored. <laughs> It's Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, instead of the church militant. It's the church mumbling. <laughs> Somehow or other, he says, and with the best intentions, we have shown the world, the typical Christian, in the likeness of a crashing bore. And this in the name of one who ne assuredly never bored a soul in those 33 years during which he passed through the world like a flame. That's very significant. Everybody wondered at Christ. Everybody was amazed at it. Friends, enemies, agnostics. Is there any other human being in the history of the world who never bored anybody? Now, this, to me, is much more important than most people think. Boredom, Walker Percy points out in uh, Lost in the Cosmos, which is, I think, just about the funniest book of philosophy anybody has ever written. Highly recommended. Uh, Percy points out that the very word boredom does not exist in ancient languages. That is generalized boredom. I'm just bored, not bored with cutting wood or bored with tilling the ground, I'm just bored. That's very significant. It's equally significant that there is only one person who ever lived that nobody can write good stories about. You can write good stories about fictional people like King Arthur or uh, Martians, you can write good stories about historical people like Napoleon or Julius Caesar, uh, but you cannot write good stories about Jesus. Evangelicals try to, and they, they, they succeed in showing that it's impossible because they're all embarrassingly bad. Really, really bad. It's impossible. You can't do it. Nobody has ever done it, nobody ever will do it. The real figure in the Gospels is so big that all our versions of him are laughably tiny in comparison. Well, that proves something. You have to have something of the imaginative mind uh, and the intuitive mind of a, uh, a writer or reader of good stories to understand that. But most people have that kind of mind, unless they've been corrupted by years at Harvard or MIT. <laughs> uh, and, and that's impressive. Uh, the only two totally successful fictional portraits of Jesus that I know of in all of human history are, first of all, the one that Dostoevsky paints in the famous uh, parable of the Grand Inquisitor, in which Jesus utters not a word, not a word, and performs no action except one. After the Inquisitor is all over and has brilliantly depicted who Jesus is and what he's all about, without Jesus doing anything. Jesus simply uh, 
leans over and kisses him. Absolutely brilliant. The other one is, I think, what future generations, maybe even thousands of years from now, will still remember C.S. Lewis for as his greatest achievement. Aslan. Many children wrote letters to C.S. Lewis saying some version of this question. Uh, Mr. Lewis, uh, I, I go to Sunday school and I'm a Christian, but I love Aslan more than I love Jesus. Is that bad? <laughs> and of course, Lewis said, of course not. Aslan is Jesus, as he might have appeared in another world. It's not an allegory. It's a, a, an imagination. But what Lewis enabled you to do was to spontaneously feel towards Aslan the way that those who met the real Jesus spontaneously felt towards Jesus. That kind of frisson, that kind of, of I don't know what the noun is, but when the hairs in the back of your neck stand up. When you stop breathing for a minute. When you say, I never saw that before. Uh, the combination of, of standstill shock and fiery dynamic passion at the same time. The, the, the wonder, the Thelma, he did I should modify my remarks by saying that there's some fairly decent Jesus fiction around that's rare. Anne Rice wrote two good books about that during the Christian phase. I don't know what happened to her after that. But very, very rare. All right, there's two big ideas. Here's the third one. We've talked about Christianity as drama. That's our first big idea. We've talked about Christianity as dogma rather than modernist uplift. That's our second big idea. Now the third big idea is to identify the first two. The dogma is the drama, she says in the title of one of her essays. Christ in his divine innocence said to the woman of Samaria, you worship you know not what. Being apparently under the impression that it might be desirable on the whole to know what one was worshiping. He thus showed himself sadly out of touch with the 20th century mind, for the cry today is, away with the tedious complexities of dogma, let us have a simple spirit of worship, just worship no matter what. The only drawback to this demand for a generalized and undirected worship is the practical difficulty of arousing any sort of enthusiasm for the worship of nothing in particular. The newspapers don't make many headlines about everything in general and nothing in particular. Chesterton brilliantly criticizes Nietzsche, the worshiper of will and passion, uh, for saying, in effect, I don't care what you will, just will something. In other words, I have no will in the matter. It's boring. in Creator Chaos, which was not reproduced in this anthology, so I can't find it here, where she goes through all the major Christological heresies of the first six ecumenical councils uh, and finds that they're amazingly relevant to modern problems. They're not all historical, dusty curiosities at all. You can label almost every modern heretic, either uh, you know, an Arian or an Apollonian or a, a monophysite or or something like that. It's a, it's a tour de force. Fourth big idea. The atheist's major argument against God is always the problem of evil, by which the atheist never means sin, but always suffering. All right, there are two problems with evil, really. The problem of sin, which is much more serious, and the problem of suffering. But Unfortunately, the most serious form of evil, sin, is easily explainable. Look in the mirror. The other one is much more difficult. What does she do with this? She writes, the creative will 
presses on to its end, capital I, so she knows she's talking about God's will, regardless of what it must suffer, by the way. It does not choose suffering, but it will not avoid it, and must expect it, given the character of man and his world. We say that it is love, and we say that it sacrifices itself for what it loves, and this is true, provided we understand what we mean by sacrifice. Sacrifice is what it looks like to other people, but to that which loves, I think, it does not appear so. When one really cares, the self is forgotten, and the sacrifice becomes only a part of its activity. Ask yourself, if there is something you supremely love and want to do, do you count as self-sacrifice all the difficulties encountered? or the other possible activities that you must cast aside? No, you do not. The time when you deliberately say, I must sacrifice this or that or the other thing, is only when you do not supremely desire your primary end in view. At such times, you are doing your duty, and this is admirable, but it is not love. Love is total. What a freeing thing it is that Jesus says you must love the Lord your God, with all your heart. We think of that as, as, as oppressive. It's impossible. It gives us a guilt complex. No, it's just the opposite. It frees you. Because there's nothing left. Try to give God 90% or even 10% and you'll be oppressed and you'll be unfree and you'll be arguing about the additional 1 or 2%. Give him everything and there's nothing to argue about. So love is. So love is the answer to the problem of suffering. Christ did not come into the world to take away suffering, but to transform its meaning. A fifth big idea I might call just realism, if I want a single word for it, or maybe objective truth if I want an abstract word for it or maybe relevance to the real world, if I wanted a sociological word for it. Uh, in the title essay of the series of essays called Creator Chaos, this essay is called Creator Chaos, she writes, it is fatal to let people suppose that Christianity is only a mode of feeling. It is vitally necessary to insist that it is first and foremost a rational explanation of the universe. It is hopeless to offer Christianity as a vaguely idealistic aspiration of a simple and consoling kind. It is, on the contrary, hard, tough, exacting, a complex doctrine steeped in a drastic and uncompromising realism. It is fatal to imagine that everybody knows quite well what Christianity is and needs only a little encouragement to practice it. The brutal fact is that in this so-called Christian country, not one person in a hundred has the faintest notion what the church teaches about God or man or society or the person of Jesus Christ. And this was written in the 50s. She's rather prophetic. She says in one passage uh, that uh, uh, we've already lost the one hemisphere. We're going south. The global south is the future. She wrote this in the 50s. The reason why the churches are discredited today is not that they are bigoted about theology, but that they run away from theology. The Church of Rome alone has retained her prestige because she puts theology in the foreground of her teachings. And she's speaking more about Protestant Episcopalianism than about Anglicanism, I suppose. If Christian dogma is irrelevant to life, then to what in heaven's name is it relevant? Since religious dogma is in fact nothing but a statement of doctrines concerning the nature of life and the real world. The central dogma, the incarnation, which by the way is the one very clear and very distinct line in the sand that sharply and totally separates Christianity from all other religions of the world, no matter how many profound unities there are. Because if you believe that this man, Jesus Christ, is uh, the Son of God, and fully divine, as well as fully human, you are a Christian. And if you do not believe that, you are not a Christian. Now, many people are Christians who don't call themselves Christians, because they don't 
profess uh, adherence to a, a specific Christian creed or denomination, but they believe that about Jesus. And many people who call themselves Christians don't believe that about Jesus, so they are Christians. But that's an either or. The central dogma of the Incarnation is that by which relevance stands or falls. If Christ was only man, then he is entirely irrelevant to thoughts about God. If he is only God, then he is entirely irrelevant to thoughts about man. It is in the strictest sense necessary to the salvation of relevance that one should believe rightly in the Incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And unless he believes rightly, there's not the faintest reason why he should believe at all. Another big idea, I think this is number six, I'm bad about both mathematics and memory. Did I get to five or only to four? It doesn't matter. Uh, is a realism about sin. Here is a striking sentence. Sayer uh, frequently has these Chestertonian paradoxes which stand everything on their head until you realize that they do the exactly the opposite, that the world is standing on its head and it's putting things right side up. Where she says, one of the greatest sources of strength of Christianity today lays, lay, lies in the profoundly pessimistic view it takes of human nature. Hurrah for pessimism. The people who are most discouraged and despairing and despondent because of the barbarity and stupidity of human behavior at this time are those who think highly of Homo sapiens as a product of evolution and who still cling to an optimistic belief in the civilizing influence of progress and enlightenment. If you believe in sin, you can be an optimist. Hey. For desperate sinners, we're doing pretty well. But if you don't believe in sin, you have to be a horrible pessimist. We're supposed to be perfect. What went wrong? Christianity has compelled the mind of mankind not because it is the most cheering view of human existence, because it is the truest to the facts. But the Christian church now finds itself called upon to proclaim the old and hated doctrine of sin as a gospel of cheer and encouragement. The bad news is part of the good news and a precondition for it. The final tendency of typically modern philosophers, hailed in their day as a release from the burden of sinfulness, has been to bind man hard and fast in the chains of an iron determinism. People is explained by the influences of heredity and environment or glandular makeup or the control exercised by the unconscious or economic necessity or the mechanics of biological development. All these have been invoked to assure man that he is not responsible for his misfortunes. Well, we haven't come very far from uh, Genesis 3. Uh, the devil made me do it. My wife made me do it. My genes made me do it. My capitalist society made me do it. My complexes made me do it. Evil has been represented as something imposed upon a man from without, not created by him from within. The dreadful conclusion follows inevitably that he is not responsible for evil and therefore cannot alter it. No. What a compliment to call a man a sinner. Today, if we could really be persuaded that we are miserable sinners, that the trouble is not outside us but inside us, and that therefore, by the grace of God, we can do something to put it right, if we believe that, we would receive that message as the most hopeful and heartening thing that can be imagined. Unbelievers often see that point better than Christians do. For instance, John Steinbeck, in his semi-autobiographical journal travels with Charlie. Uh, he's on the road and he's you know, on the outs and he's kind of you know, a, not, not a, a nice, optimistic, helpful, hopeful, uh, socially forward-looking person. Uh, and Charlie is his, uh, his mangy dog. 
And he, he talks to me, he likes Charlie better than people. And uh, somewhere in that book, there's a story of, uh, he's going to the South, and it's Sunday morning, he hasn't been to church for many years, he's, he's an agnostic, at best, an atheist at worst. And he hears a, a, a Baptist uh, white clapboard church, uh, and people singing him, he says, oh, go in. So he sits down uh, just in time for the sermon. And the sermon is a fire and brimstone sermon for the preacher. You're miserable sinners. And he sits there and smiles, doesn't say anything. He's always with him. And afterwards, doesn't say anything to anybody else. He goes out and sits on a bench and talks to Charlie. He said, you know, Charlie, if I had the guts, I'd go up to that preacher and I'd, I'd give him my glad hand and say, thank you, preacher. You made me feel better than I've felt in 20 years. What a compliment. You called me a sinner. Nobody called me that before. God must think I'm pretty important. A seventh idea. Uh, she's written quite a bit about this. Uh, it's about work, the theology of work. Uh, one of her best dramas, I think, is The Zeal of Thy House. It's taking place in the Middle Ages, and it's about building a cathedral. And uh, the main theme of it is that uh, it's, it's the worker that is for the work, not vice versa. It's, it's the, the good part of the theme of uh, an otherwise bad book, namely The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. Uh, if you ever read that, you probably felt two things about it. This is very unchristian and, and selfish and, and proud and arrogant. But on the other hand, there's something right about it. And Dorothy Sears gets what's right, right. Here's what she says about work. The unsacramental attitude of modern society to man and matter is probably closely connected with its unsacramental attitude towards work. The modern tendency seems to be to identify work with gainful employment. And this is, I maintain, the essential heresy at the back of the great economic fallacy which allows wheat and coffee to be burned and fish to be used for manure while whole populations stand in need of food. The result of the work is thought to be a mere byproduct. The aim of the work is to make money, to do something else. Doctors practice medicine not primarily to relieve suffering, but to make a living. The cure of the patient is something that has to happen as a means to that end. But a medieval guild insisted not only on the employer's duty to his workmen, but also on the laborer's duty to his work. But we cannot expect a sacramental attitude to work while many people are forced by our evil standard of values to do work, which is a spiritual degradation. A long series of financial trickeries, for example, or the manufacture of vulgar and useless trivialities. Uh, you find in the papal encyclicals of, of society, and especially work, uh, this fundamental point, which is rediscovered in the modern world because truths are rediscovered only when they're denied by heresies. That's why God allows heresies. An eighth point, uh, another, let's say, typically modern heresy is a wrong notion of society, uh, and that elicits a, a profounder reflection on the nature of society, which is neither autonomous individualism nor a kind of quasi-totalitarian collectivism. About this, she writes, it is impossible to have a Christian doctrine of society except as a corollary to Christian dogma about the Trinity and the place of man in the universe. In other words, you need metaphysics. Uh, Frank Sheed's Society and Sanity, I think, takes up many of the ideas in Dorothy Sayers and expresses them more systematically. If you're at all interested in uh, Christian social theology and ethics, I think that's the best one. At the center of this is the idea of a natural law, not just a natural moral law, but a natural law of, of everything in man. Uh, it's described this way by Dorothy Sayers. There is only one real law, the law of the universe. 
It may be fulfilled in different ways, either by way of judgment or by way of grace, but it must be fulfilled one way or another. If men will not understand the meaning of judgment, they will never come to understand the meaning of grace. If they hear not Moses or the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And she applies this to, of all things, economics. The ninth idea is not really in creed or chaos itself, but it's her most famous achievement. Uh, well, I suppose the most famous achievement is her detective stories, but theologically, I think it's her profoundest achievement, her aesthetics. The Mind of the Maker is a, a, a very creative book. I don't think it's by any means a, a successful or final statement, but it's a very useful book to, to get you thinking about the relationship between aesthetics on the one hand and Christian dogma, especially the Trinity, on the other hand. Two topics that we rarely connect together. In fact, in the modern world, our typical attitude towards the whole realm of, of beauty and the beautiful and the arts is that the artist is supposed to be a rebel. He's supposed to be a social outcast. He's supposed to live in a cold water East Greenwich Village flats, uh, go, go insane 